Sis and tell, sis and tell A whole lot of talk, not a whole lot of nothing Amanda does stand up, Allison's on TV And when they hop on the phone, it's the place you wanna be Sis and tell Hey, Allie Hey, man, what's going on? I've been drilling I've been drilling in my garage. I know. You are really. You, this, you've taken Handy Mandy Part 2 to a whole other level. I know. I had to call my father-in-law, though, because I was like, the drill is screaming at me. I was like, what am I doing wrong? Because literally, it was like not. It was making these crazy high-pitched noises. Like oh, it gosh. felt like, like a dentist's office? Yeah. Oh, it felt like the drill was mad at me. Honestly, I'm so sensitive. I'm like, why are you mad at me? So I, it, I was like, first of all, I didn't have the bit in the right way like it was in but I I had to just tighten it and then I was also not drilling it in um, parallel enough and that but once he was like oh let's troubleshoot that's what I did then I've been drilling hooks all over my garage everything I'm trying to get off the floor I just want you know when you like I feel like you've just seized the moment yes when when you're or when you're you get into that I need to organize mode and that's what I was doing I know well I'm at I told you I've been organizing because of the home edit women and I the the last thing I did was I call it my Harry Potter closet. I know you have one too. It's under the <laughs> stairs. Yeah. And it's where I keep all uh, all the dishes and, and like serving plates and things like that. I brought out so much stuff. I couldn't walk in there. I literally could not walk in there because there was so much junk on the floor. So now it's, of course, now I can't walk in my living room because there's all there's the so junk much. that was yeah. in the closet. But I have all these plates and things and I was going to give them away. And then my friend said, well, I'll tell you, you need to save them because as soon as your boys go into an apartment, they're going to want plates and you can just give it to them and the silverware. And I thought I, it did not even dawn on me. I am so glad she didn't. she's years ahead. <laughs> no, it didn't dawn on me to save it for them. Well, and if she... So- if she is years ahead, then I am decades ahead because you know what I have saved? I have saved their toys for my future grandchildren. Well, I have that. That I think about. Okay. That's just like giving away. But like, I didn't think about like, you want these Banana Republic stoneware green plates for your apartment. First of all, they weigh, <laughs> they weigh a hundred pounds. And second of all, stoneware. why did Banana Republic make plates? Nobody uh-huh. can answer that for me. I cannot imagine how expensive the <laughs> Banana Republic. Remember when Banana Republic first came out? Yeah. So first of all, we have to go back to like, what is it? Like the mid 80s and the River Chase Galleria Mall in Birmingham, Alabama opened. Yep. And it was, it was like the Mecca of malls, right? Yep. So this it is ha- 1986, I want to say. And what was attached to the mall? Uh, the Winfrey Hotel? Yes. And that's Win- where I got married. Why do you act like that's a trick question? It's not. I was just <laughs> trying to engage. Okay. So, <laughs> so, which was like a like upscale, gorgeous hotel. And it was connected to the mall. There was like a glass elevator going up to the hotel, I want to say. Like it was. Be- I think the- you're remembering it more like a Disney palace than a mall. But sure, let's go was, with. The- was- <laughs> there was a boardwalk fries. And there was yeah. a. What okay, what the- was sticking out of the Banana Republic? Yeah, the Jeep. A the Jeep. Jeep. Okay, front. Yeah. third question. So why did Banana Republic make plates ever? And why did they need to have a Jeep sticking out? This safari theme at yeah. some point, which they, they eventually, you know, moved beyond. But that's how, I don't know if it was like a trend of the time, but Banana Republic did start off at like high-end army depot <laughs> right it was i feel like it was that influence i wonder if that movie came out the same time but out of africa remember robert redford in that yeah. movie and everybody was wearing like the flowy skirts and the the um okay. those neutral colored like almost the like khakis and the green jackets with a hat that was that banana republic style it was the safari the chic. safari safari <laughs> chic yeah but safari it's not casual like- like, were there other stores that carried various clothing, including Safari Chic? Or was, like, Banana Republic, like, this is it? Well, the Gap this always is- had everything. You could pretty much find anything at the Gap. So, yeah, I mean, the Gap is the king of khakis. So, sure, you could find khaki-colored things there. But I'm not sure they were ever so specific. Banana Republic, they created this lane. And then, I, I don't know how long it lasted, but they eventually moved away from it and became more like work clothes, you know, sort of like the dressy casual. Like J. Crew. Yes, like J. Crew. And so, you know, our Banana Republic in Chattanooga closed years ago. 
I used to go there all the time because it was great staples. Our Gap even closed. I was going to say, I remember there used to be more Gaps than Starbucks. Right. And now there's more Starbucks than Gaps. There's not, I can't even find a Gap. I know. And I cannot find a decent pair of pants at Starbucks. I mean, it's impossible. <laughs> But I have all those. I have Banana Republic plates. I have Banana Republic jackets. I have Gap jackets, you know, jean and other. Those, some of those, those are, they had the timeless staples that remain timeless and staples because I still have them in my closet 30 years later. I still have my Banana Republic staple. <laughs> <laughs> did they make staplers? That staplers? is weird. <laughs> yeah, no, they probably did. I bet you can find, yes. it's probably like gold or brass or something and cost $42. Probably. <laughs> okay, I have another, I'm switching gears, but I have a question for you. Okay, yeah. think, think about this, the answer. Um, when you think about me, would you, would you, if you were describing me to someone else, would you say one of the three? I am, uh, or maybe one of the four. I am non-athletic. I am coordinated. I am athletically inclined or athletic. I would say athletic, oh. Hmm. Definitely athletically inclined, but I don't necessarily, I would, I don't think I would label you as athletic, but maybe somewhere in between athletically inclined and athletic, right? Like you, you exercise, you're coordinated, you like to play those games, but you're not like obsessed with sports and you weren't, and I know, I know you were the captain of your basketball team. Right. Yeah. But that just I mean, it was like, look, you're the captain of the basketball team at Indian Springs. School, <laughs> just like, <laughs> right. That was yeah. the equivalent of me being the captain of my softball team at Camp Rama. I was going right? to say, I'm pretty sure that our mock trial team could have taken us on and beat us. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So that's that's what. What okay. would you say about me? No, I, I, well, you know what I'd say. Let's <laughs> not go what there. You would say. What would you say about Alan? He's athletic. Okay. So here's my point. I think, and you've just proven it pretty well, I think women and men are put to different standards when it comes to categorizing them. And we're going to use this athletic, coordinated, non-athletic genre because I think it's fairly innocuous, right? Without going, we could go down a huge rabbit hole of all the other ways there's these inequities. And this only came to the surface when, you know, you and uh, Abe and I were talking last weekend and talking about different people in his life. And I, and I think I had even said, oh, is that person athletic? And he went, well, and then, you know, I was trying to say, well, what's his, what's his gauge, right? Who does he consider athletic to compare people to? I said, well, do you consider me athletic? Well, <laughs> and then I asked Alan and Alan goes, well, and then he says to me, I mean, you're coordinated. And I thought, well, if I'm not athletic, and I'm not saying I play sports every day, but to your point, so I work out almost every day. I, I, I know how to, you know, snow ski and water ski and wake surf and ride a bike. <laughs> I'm going to throw that True. in there. Yeah. I played softball for four years of my life, basketball for like 12 years, and I was the captain of my team. I can pretty much pick up any sport. Yeah. I played tennis as an adult for four years. So all these things are not to say I'm such a great athlete, but if that doesn't constitute an athletic woman, mm -hmm. then that bar is very high. So then I started asking Alan, okay, how about the men, you know, first, who are the women in your life who you think are athletic? And I knew exactly who was going to mention, like two people. And then I said, what about the, the men? Williams sister? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Serena. That's your, and, that's your standard. Right. You have to right. Mia Hamm. I mean, I'm like, really? So then I said, what about the men? Basically, every man I mentioned, he was like, yeah, he's athletic. Yeah, he's I'm like, really? Because the dudes you mentioned are drinking more beer than lifting weights, you know, but there is there is a different qualification for men and women. And it really makes me upset. I, yeah. I don't want to be athletically inclined. Like I want someone to say she's athletic. That yeah. doesn't have to mean right. I play professional sports, but so it really he, got me annoyed. So here's a question. What happened? What did your... Um psychologists say after you brought this up <laughs> right and let me also preface this every time this i bring up really something bothering you well every time i bring up something like this then alan says thanks for throwing me under the bus and i'm not i want to be clear alan is oh, the most he is the, the most respectful supportive loving right. encouraging he's the one who actually made me if i could be athletic he is the one who has encouraged me and taught me 
probably 90% of my, well, probably 100% of my athletics that I've taken on since marriage for sure. Right. Um, but if I wasn't, I guess if I wasn't athletically inclined, I couldn't now be athletic according to Levovitz standards. So I'm not throwing Alan under the bus. What I'm doing is I'm using our, our recent discussion to highlight something that I'm not sure, well, no, I'm not sure people even care about. But if they do care about it, I'm not sure they know about it. The standards. The standards. Yeah. The standards. They're oh, unfair. you're you're right. And I also, you know, I'm coming at it looking at your entire athletic um, career. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But you're right. You are, you are athletic. Okay. Thank and you. I did. Thank and you. I, 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 would, I just I, need to be validated. So I was somewhere in between athletically inclined and athletic, but I'm I appreciate gonna, that. Yeah. But I, you know, because that's what I said at the beginning. But I'm going to go towards completely athletic. Well, and I skewed the survey a little for you because really, Alan was like between coordinated and athletic. So if I mm-hmm. only gave you coordinated and athletic, I'm thinking oh. you might have you might have opted for athletic. But yes. I threw in I threw in a little wrench there to give you a, a middle ground, so you didn't have to choose. But even in the middle ground, I didn't. I chose towards as you know yes. in between thank you so thank you. you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> i think we all know what i am and it's none of those <laughs> <laughs> no you are you are an enthusiastically semi-coordinated athletically inclined um person that is very uh glass half full yeah because i and i know I you're afraid of balls so i that, don't even <laughs> right i don't even know what glass you're looking at because i don't think any of that is i but am you're not, a great runner like you have a great stamina and you yeah. actually when you when you choose to work out you're you are a great you, you can hold your own but i feel like working out is different than like running for exercise or for mental health is different than running to compete Agreed. But right? that's the problem. Because how many adults are running how many adults are competing that's if you're right. not at the elite level? So when right. you're a kid, I would say everybody's athletic because everybody's going, you know, they're they're doing some P E or some sport. When you're an adult, I'm not you know, what I've run a few five Ks. Does that make me an athlete? I don't and know. And can you be athletic but not coordinated? That's hard. Right? Because I I was in all the sports. Yeah. And uh, as we like to say, I was the best girl on our basketball team, <laughs> but I was also the only girl right. Me in too. the co-ed team. Yeah, I was the only and girl in our league at the JCC. You know what happened? And I know this is in some of my earliest stand-up material, and it's based out of truth, but the the coach did do skins versus shirts for practice, right, when he would have us compete against each other. And I remember one time being really worried he was going to put me on the skin. (laughs) And so I started bringing a tube top with me to practice. I was like eight, you know. So I, first of all, would have had nothing to show and nothing to hold up that tube top. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like, I don't know what I was, but he did. I was like, am I? But it was also like he could put me on the skins team and it wouldn't matter because I keep my shirt on. And still like, there's that girl. Right. That only girl. We're not going to pass the ball to. Anyway, right, <laughs> which I definitely think it affected my confidence in myself yeah. because if I'd been on all, all girls team, then it's different. It's much different. But you're right. Like I do. I feel like I'm good at dancing and hip hop, hip hop. That's you coordination because I yeah. and I can also express myself within hip hop like ballet. I took ballet. They didn't know what to do with me. Right. I, I was not a good ballerina. Well, I will say one of Levi's best friends, Sam, who is actually swimming at University of Georgia next year, mm-hmm. um, and he is an exceptional swimmer. I mean, he is like elite athlete. And his mom told me something funny that like he said to her once, you know, I'm a pretty good athlete for a swimmer. And I'd, I'd never heard that before. And she said, oh, yeah. So I guess I don't know if it's true or not, but apparently a lot of swimmers, like they are really good swimmers and strong in the pool, but they can't necessarily translate that to a basketball, a soccer, a baseball, mm-hmm. you know, not in that those other arenas. And, and his you know, claim to fame as well. I'm not just a strong swimmer. I'm actually pretty athletic. So that might answer your question of coordinated versus athletic and how that is right it's interesting because I feel like I was quickly making this analogy of swimmers to stand-up comedians right because swimmer you're a solo act right you're you're as good as you as much effort as you put into it except during relay 
that's when it's a team effort. You're right, but I'm not talking about relay. <laughs> because well, there I'm are like, relays and they are important. Because like I'm like oh if, like if I I'm a good it'd be like I'm a good actor for being a stand up, right? And it takes a different skill set because you're working with someone else's words. You have to partner with someone. So right. it's it's and that's like when you go get out of the pool and you get onto a court with a team, that takes a different skill set of working with people of, you know, all that stuff. There's like yeah. an emotional intelligence that's a part of that. And they talk about who is that famous uh, athletic, um, that famous uh, Olympian swim, swimmer who he's um, uh, Michael Phelps. Yep. Right. And he talked about how lonely it also is being a swimmer because you get so into his head he got so into his head yeah he went through some challenges after he after the olympics yeah Yeah. so it's a those um but you know man i think swimming is one of those things like running that the more you do it the better you get i don't know i don't know if that's true the quicker (laughs) no you do get quicker i look even me i'm not saying i'm a great swimmer but if I started going to the pool every day, right, you get stronger. I, I would get str- you get stronger, you get quicker. Yeah, I will. Like I, I, I endure it's running. I it's think, still and, the doggy paddle when it comes down to yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, I, I will run now. I used to not. I just couldn't stand running. I will do it now just for the the cardio part of it. But I will never be a consider myself a good runner. That yeah. I will admit. That I'm Who not. Who knew? No. Who knew I would be yeah. good at running? But it all has to do with my mi- the mix I'm listening to, right. the music. If if I don't have fast music, then I'm slow. Yeah, it has to do with who's chasing me. That's how fast right. I'm going. <laughs> so uh, the other thing, as long as I'm upsetting Alan during this podcast, then I'll, <laughs> then I'll bring up something else that is upsetting him, and that is uh, I I don't even realize it until we're all home, and I know you and I and our families were both home in Birmingham for Passover. So it, those, the traits that we share come out like exponentially <laughs> greater than the solo efforts of the Goldstein clan. But there's one thing with mommy and daddy too. Well, in that household. So there's one thing that I guess we all do. And then when we all do it together, it <laughs> makes them nuts. Oh, can I say, I know what one of the things is. What is it? Slamming doors. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, that's exactly, <laughs> that is exactly it. And he Knew is, it. he came Thanks. home from the weekend and he, he's like, <laughs> he's like, who am I? Bam. And he is slamming every door in the house. I'm like, that is really loud. He goes, that is your family. But, All you do is slam doors. But it's not, I feel like for people who don't know us, maybe this is your first time listening. It's not because we're angry. No, and, and I, blame we're not it angry. On, I blame it on the suburban. It's all the suburban. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's the sub, not the suburban area. It's the suburban, the vehicle. Yeah. That yeah. door was very heavy and we had no choice but to slam it shut. Yeah. And yeah. because of that, we put all of that force into every door you know do you know why our kids even you know why our kids don't slam doors because of alan no the minivan automatic they they've never they've never had to close a door in their life they They just just got out and then the door magically closes i mean they have had to close other doors they've they've been (laughs) in other vehicles but you know their formative years their formative years of learning how to open and close a door it was like the equivalent you know what minivan doors are the equivalent of of our having to grow up with tennis shoes or shoes that you had to tie and them growing up with Velcro. Mm-hmm. They never had to struggle when they were five with like the frustration of not being able to tie your shoe. They yeah. were just Velcroing it. Or the difference between analog and digital clocks. And I have to say, I still, it takes me some time to read a, an analog clock and it's an embarrassing amount of time. <laughs> and <laughs> Come on. Yeah, especially if there's no numbers on it. Because I'm always... That's a problem. It's not intuitive. You don't just see it and know. No, you do. Yes. It's intuitive. It's a clock. Well, (laughs) I'm just saying (laughs) I grew up with digital. You You grew up with digital? Yes. And also I grew up with Velcro. Do you don't remember? I was like six and I said, someone, can someone tie my shoe? And you and Stuart were horrified that I did not know how to tie my shoe. And I remember sitting, this is how good my memory is. I remember sitting on the bottom stair and you and Stuart both teaching me how to tie my shoe using like the bunny ear thing. Well, wait, so there's there's two parts to the story. And one is 
I can't believe you didn't know how to tie your shoes at age six. That is horrifying. I'm still horrified. Number two is I didn't realize I was nice to you that early in your age. So that means <laughs> if, if I started being nice to you when you were six, I only have one more year of this podcast to pay no. off my servitude no. for being a bad sister. I think you were annoyed and embarrassed. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, when Arthur this. was starting kindergarten, and uh, I've, I told this story <laughs> at uh, one of my board meetings for um, an organization where we focus on literacy because I always say how, you know, as a new mom or a, a mom, I was had three kids at the time when he started kindergarten, but a mom who was first time kindergartner, um, we are driving to our local public school to register and they did this kindergarten readiness sort of test, I will call it. And it really wasn't as, you know, testy as I thought. It was more just like to make sure they're, they're, they have the skills to enter kindergarten. But there were like 25 different things, right? Does the, you know, can they say their name? Can they say their last name, their phone number, their address? Then it got into, can they tie their own shoes? And so that was that first red flag. And I started screaming like, oh. <gasps> He doesn't know how to tie any shoes. He's only worn Velcro. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm like, Arthur, just tell them that you have. And he's like, okay, mommy. I go, just tell them. Velcro shoes. Okay. Then I was like, can they say their ABCs? And I was like, literally, I'm like a mile from the school. I'm driving. He's in the back seat. I'm like, Arthur, say, say your ABCs. And he's like, okay. And he goes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, K, L, M, and a B. I was like, no, you forgot I and J. You forgot I and J. You're never, <laughs> I'm screaming. He's getting upset. I'm getting upset. Needless to say, you know, he's 20, almost 22 now, and he knows he's, his alphabet. He's okay. He knows how to tie his shoes. He is finally potty trained. Like, all is good. It all worked out, I just know, as everyone told me. Wiping their own butt, that's a big thing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> So I have another fun fact for you. Do you, have you ever heard of the word gruntled? I've heard of the word disgruntled. Okay. And what does that mean according to you? Like upset? Yeah. Anno disgruntled. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think gruntled is a word? Let's start there. We all know disgruntled. I'm disgruntled. I'm yeah. upset. I'm un uneasy about it. I'm dissatisfied. Right. What do, you th do you think gruntled the same way, dissatisfied, what would you say the opposite is? Um, so I have this discussion with Aaron about uninterested and disinterested all the time. But those, always, are, those are different. Right. But I always forget. Right. I know. So dis, <laughs> dissatisfied, satisfied is okay, the opposite. Right. So let's do disgruntled. What's the opposite? I'm, I don't, um, I'm not going to say gruntled because gruntled sounds like you're still annoyed. Exactly. It sounds like you're still angry. Yeah. But you're What does not. it mean? So gruntled actually means this came up, I think, on a Facebook post the other day. And I, of course, I had to go double check it and go down the rabbit hole. So gruntled does mean satisfied, happy, satisfied, even though it sounds like you're still angry. Right. Because there's <laughs> I'm grunting. So, I'm so gruntled. Right. I'm gruntled. It's got that, that, what is it, the onomatopoeia where it sounds like the word, but it's not. I'm right. not gruntled. So apparently, so this is what happened according to my very quick two minute research that in the 1930s, people all knew the word disgruntled, but they really wanted there to be an opposite in measure. And that they, unlike how usually um, when you add on like the, like the dis, the un, all of those, the, what are those called? Pre, uh, pre, uh, pre prefix. Uh, pre yeah. Yeah. Thank the you. Prefix or <laughs> pre, pre, pre. Okay, pre. It's like a game show. When prefix, you add the, pre, pre when you the add a prefix, prefix. prefix. Yeah. Right. There's a root word. You know, I took Latin for however many years. So, Postfix. Right. So there's a, there's a, there's a root word and then words that come from that. This had the opposite. This is almost deconstructed. So disgruntled apparently was first. In the 1930s, they started saying the word gruntled as its opposite. So as happy, satisfied, pleasing. Oh, I'm um, gruntled. Right. But no one, I've never heard anyone no. until like a week ago use the word gruntled, but I'm going to start using it. I'm going to make it popular. It's like there was an urban dictionary in the 1930s and it made it in at that point. Right. It was part of like slang. Right. You but, know? I mean, it's been around for a while. 80 years, 90 years later, people still don't know it's a word. Well, no, Didn't it really. Didn't get much traction. I wouldn't say it has been around for 80 years. I would say it was created 80 years ago. Or not. Right? Yeah. Be because there are, there's vernacular that we used in the 80s and 90s that's been around, but we haven't been using it. Yeah. 
right? So it's not, it's understandable. If it, if it was made up and part of their slang, then, and then it faded away and people are like, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was a good try. No, yeah. it's not going to stick. I'm going to diss, I'm going to diss that word. Um, by the way, which diss, did that come from dissatisfy? Disrespect? Yeah. Where did diss, I remember though, mommy saying diss for the first time. Well, how did she use it? She said, she did a whole like slew of like, jargon that was of the time she was like don't diss me talk to the hand you go girl and she was like that's what all the girls say on the ricky lake show (laughs) like she i don't know why she was watching like ricky lake or what was that other talk show that was during that time jenny right yes yeah yeah Um, jenny oh gosh Yes, whatever her name is. Yeah, she looked like a Karen of her time. But she, you know, like, that's where she got all that from the Ricky Lake show. She's like, talk to the hand. Don't you be dissing me. And I was like, Mom, please stop talking. Yeah, and you need to stop imitating her. She's going to be really. (laughs) I know. (laughs) So the other day, something happened to me that I felt only you, well, not only you, but especially you could appreciate. And it's never happened to me, but I know it happens to you. And that is, I was at an event and we had had a, an awesome speaker and then a bunch of us were gathered around him afterwards to ask some questions. And a friend of mine turned to me who I adore and said, okay, since you are a professional interviewer, I'm ready for a really good question. Ugh. Well, first of all, I really wasn't even going to ask him a question. I was just going to you know, make a connection because we had had some similar um you know, intersections in our past, not at the same time, but similar, similar uh, places where we had been or studied. But then I felt all this pressure. Yeah. So now I'm like, oh gosh. It's not how interviewing her, works. I could ask a really good question. And he's like, okay. And then it's like, literally like, as I walk up, he kind of like, you know, opens his arms like, here she is. She's going to ask the question. And nobody was around and there really wasn't, there shouldn't have been any pressure, but I felt such pressure. And I thought, this is how Amanda and her you know, fellow comedians must feel when someone says, oh, you're a comedian? Tell me a joke. Be funny. Yeah. And that's not how it works, right? Dance, monkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually just promote my next show. Oh. I go, oh, you should come. You should come to my next show. It's this. And it's my jokes are much better in front of an audience. Oh, I should have said that. I should have said yeah. season 13 is coming I, out May 5th. Right, Tune in could, and I'll have lots just, of good questions. You turn it into like they've given you a compliment. Just say, oh, my God, that's so sweet. Right. You should it, was a com- it actually was a compliment. Yeah, and you, this this person is like a, you know, a gem of a human being and you would pull, never want to do something right. to make me uncomfortable. But I just laugh that I'm like, oh, gosh, I have to. It was my own. It was my own anxiety, not nothing really that he pressed or you, upon me. Or you turn it into, you know, you have like crowd work ready to go. You say, you're like, okay, this is a really intense question. Do you know where the bathroom is? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the final question of the evening was very similar to that, where this guy is talking about Mideast politics and, you know, Ukraine and all these very serious issues. But he had grown up um, and lived in Chicago. And so the final question of the evening was brilliant. He said, I've really, I've got, I've got the hardest question of the night, you know, the Cubs or the White Sox, right? So that, and it was a great way just to end the evening on a, on a lighter note. So, but you're right. Okay. Those are two great suggestions. So turn it around. And I should know that after having a career in, in public relations, I constantly say people don't give an answer that people want you to give, Mm -hmm. give an answer that you want them to hear. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily have to answer the question, Yes, but they don't realize that till it's, they're too far gone. It's interesting because as an interviewer, that's a great tip for an interviewee, mm. right? Especially if you're applying for a job, right? Right. So if someone's like, what are your weaknesses? Then you turn that into a positive, right? right? Well, and you, yes, that's, and that's a tricky slope too, because I think that was always our, our work around, right? Well, oh, my weakness is I work way too hard. And you want to hear what mine was? Mine was really good. That was not my weakness, by the way. Yeah. I would say, uh, so I, uh, I was like, I'm in uh, my, I've always wanted to work on my financial acumen and like P and L statements were always a little intimidating to me. And because of that, I took a professional development class about P and L's to kind of boost my confidence and knowledge. Right. So, but that's something I still would like to continue to work on. Yeah. Right. So you, so you're saying like, this has been a challenge, but this is like a solution that I 
looking at to help fix that or overcome that, even though it's something I'm still working on. Yeah. Well, my weakness is that I pretty much think I'm always right, but now I've turned <laughs> that around and I've, I've been able to rephrase that to say I'm not always right, but I am rarely wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, well, if listening to this podcast is wrong, we don't want you to be right. Thanks for listening to the latest Sis and Tell podcast. Share us with your friends. Share us with your family. Share us with your foes. As always, this has been Amanda and Allison with a whole lot of talk about a whole lot of nothing. We'll catch you next time.